Welcome to the Microsoft Security Insights Podcast with your hosts, Franklin Grimberg and Edward Walton, where we discuss Microsoft 365 security and Azure security news and products. Recorded March 9th, 2022. Good evening, Franklin. Good evening, Rod. Good evening, Brody. How you doing? Oh, yeah. Great. This is a special evening, not only because of the guests we have, but we have our score results for the SC300, and we this is our two-year anniversary for the podcast. Whoa. Really? Oh! oh. Oh. Hey! Look at that, man! Who knew? Wow! You put a goddamn oh, monkey on a piano, he'll hammer out a, a symphony, right? We just hanging right, so, around. <laughs> so I want to, I want to ask. I, I know that Brody was has been listening since the first episode. So I want to first ask this question: Out of, I mean, we've had incredible guests. I mean, and we have an incredible community. So what is out of the past two years? What guest and topic or, or what clip do you remember the most? I was and continue to be such a Matt Sozman fanboy because I don't think I would have specialized in Microsoft security if it wasn't for Matt and his videos and his education that made me look extra smart in front of clients and colleagues alike. So while that's definitely up there, um, I honestly forget her name. Excuse me, Edward, you probably remember you're the names guy, but we had the uh, com- uh, industry compliance expert on where it wasn't really technology focused, but more high level business um, and yeah, organizational yeah. compliance focus. And I thought that was just a, that was one of our more in-depth, like non nitty gritty technical interviews. That was extremely interesting yeah, compared to in- some of the other. Ingrid interviews. Rodriguez. That's it. Yes, that was a fantastic interview. Yeah. All right. So, Edward, what do you got? Um, the funnest thing we've done. Um, I mean, we had Harley Quinn on the on the show <laughs> with Tom. I, I, oh my God, that's, that that was a train wreck, right? That was really really good to see the interaction and go from a fun standpoint. I think from someone they come in i learned the most and just remember it's oh, we have some good guests i love Rand coming on i like nathan's passion um I, i'd give you one here it is the first time rod trent came on as a host i, I like how did he get here who invited him right <laughs> he just showed up <laughs> uh, i just i just dug into your your uh, sharepoint files and figured out the code i, I saw you, you got the key so that that was that was pretty good and then i i, I don't even know how brody showed up he just next thing you know he's a host you needed a compliance guy which by the way i'm gonna we're gonna call it information <laughs> security from now on not compliance guy yeah. information security guy yeah and that's then I actually just stuck. true we did need a compliance guy so that's yeah, why brody that's exactly. ended up here yeah. so all right rod what about you um i i think ed hit hit it for me uh it was the um the michelle the fiasco that we had the the knockdown drag out. I thought that was pretty good. That's what I remember the most. Um, um, oh, not like I, can I can I come in while he's thinking? Yeah. yeah. Before we stop doing the questions that got people in trouble, all the episodes when we asked people <laughs> what was their favorite product and MCAS <laughs> was the running joke, and then what product Frank loved, which is watch list, which is <laughs> a reverse joke. Any of those episodes. Love it. Right. We still we still keep those jokes going. It's fantastic. I think we'll still capture people moving forward from Microsoft right. with the, well, uh, the big to. four. It's like, it's like a Seinfeld episode, right? You gotta always have that full circle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I want to give a quick out. shout out to uh, to Eric Snyder as well. That was a fantastic interview. Eric's yep. coming in from, from Risk, Risk IQ. IQ. Yeah, that was great too. So We're gonna leave somebody to out, and they're gonna be offended. So they're we'll never come back on. You know, there. big shout out to our listener, now part of the team, uh, Asif. He is a Microsoft head now, so he's. I'll, I'll be talking about him in a minute once we get to the scores here. So okay. he'll uh, he'll uh, he'll be there. So no, um, I'd have to say that, you know, if you listen to the whole uh, Ingrid Rodriguez uh, interview um, from May thirty first, uh, episode fifty three, starting at around one oh four thirty three, 
when you asked her, well, may maybe we can hear this. So let me know, if, wave if you guys can hear this through my share screen, hopefully. Okay. Live demo today. Then I give up. So uh, for everyone out there, um, you know, go out and listen to um, this interview when uh, Edward asked, you know, if you could have a job title, what would it be? And she came up with um, innovative risk officer, which was an excellent answer. So I'll also put this episode in the show notes, but about 104, 37 for everybody to listen to the answer. It was an incredible answer. And I hope that she can come back on the show. Now, mm -hmm. on to the fun. This week is the results for the SC300, Edward versus Brody. Uh, next challenge will be the AZ-104. Uh, who else will join? Will that be Asif? Will he join? Uh, anybody else wants to join in? Um, you know, what date do you guys want to set for this? Fall. I mean, it's March 9th, fall. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> what, uh, what date do you want to set for this? Do you want two months, one a month? What's the deal? I already have this, but I let it lapse. So oh, I well, guess that's I even better. Is it competition that, we're, that we've jumped into the middle of here? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's go in yeah. April. May first. Need to get this no, April. April. no, it's spring. It's spring, summer. It's golf and biking time. Okay. I'm not writing exams all summer. It's not happening. I got a rule. All no right. exams. Over May, summer. May 11th. No. May 11th. Why is that day significant? What? What's happening May 11th? Well, we have to do it because I'm headed to Greece soon thereafter. So oh, on a vacation, right. enjoying your summer. What if, you know, <laughs> all right. So, uh, as if you've been called out now to, uh, to join the AZ-104 uh, challenge, just to let you know. All right. I'll take Here a stab go. at it. He's actually, uh, he's actually in the chat right now once he realizes that, that he's been called out. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go on to the results here. Um, let me uh, page down here. All right. So <clears throat> we have uh, first blood, and then we have the four different categories and then the total score. So first blood identity management, auth and access, apps and governance, and then total score. So who got first blood? And that was Edward. Point Edward. Wow. He took it on February 16th. Brody slid in on March 3rd. When did we when did we <laughs> agree to do this? Was it February 15th? Like you did keener? Like when, yeah. when it was like, like February 17th. We actually 17th, decided to yeah. do this. Yeah. Uh, He'd already taken it. <laughs> that is so <laughs> rude That's so, well there you go you should probably go five for five now because i put in about two hours effort overall All right, come so, on. yeah All right, identity management section score edward yeah. got an 80 percent brody yeah. is a 56 percent and point edward i thought off. that was a golf score i'd I don't know. Yeah. I, I wish i could so, shoot 80 uh, I, would, yeah. I would die for 80 <laughs> Auth and cool. access Oh, wow, really? Edward got a 58. Brody got a 62. Point Brody. Oh. Two points, Edward. I hope none Brody. of Edward's customers are watching. I hope not. <laughs> They're not <Now> secure. Perhaps. <laughs> Edward got a 58. Brody got a 60. Wow. Two okay. points, Edward. Two points, Brody. You got to beat me on governance, Ed. I'm terrible at governance. And now on governance. No way. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Governor. So you Edward's won. A 59. Oh. Brody 60. You won two on points, just identity management. <laughs> two points, Edward. Three points, Brody. Brody, you're in the lead. Give I can't that, believe that, that excited face, you know, that uh, I don't know. Uh, like you actually have a chance here. And the total oh, well. score is? Yeah. <laughs> 748, Edward. Brody 79. Points, Woo! Edward. Well, you know, I have to tell you. We didn't set what the tiebreaker was going to be because you each have three points if you look at this. So yeah. if we look at the tiebreaker as total score, it would be Edward. A tiebreaker of first blood, it would be Edward. So even though you have the tied in points, the tiebreaker goes to Edward. So he can get up and dance again like he was just doing. Better looking, uh, Edward, tiebreaker, ooh, right? To be the, yeah, to beat the man, go. you got to beat the man. Yeah, ooh, man, really man. identity management really saved your butt there, eh, bud? Look at that. Well, I do more of that because I'm always... <laughs> Query. That's what happened on, on the last test. He on the uh, SC two hundred. It was uh, Azure Defender that saved him on the whole thing. Remember that? Unreal. Yeah. He just That's does one area that he does gets really lucky in, 
and then he beats up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Total luck. Total <laughs> luck. Yeah. Ed, Ed, honestly, I spent two hours on apps and governance because I never touched them really that much before. And I just basically just didn't even study for the other two because I just I'm really, su- like, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually surprised you passed because of the 56 on identity management. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised too. When I saw 709, I'm like, whatever. I passed. <laughs> like, I'm probably not going to win the contest. No, it's, it's really high put- weighted, you know. I, yeah. the the identity management that's a, that's a heavily weighted areas identity management yeah, so I was really I was really shocked so maybe I, they uh... I struggle on those three so I, I had no you know I, I didn't have any you know hope that I was going to beat him in those last three because the auth and access the auth I'm good at the access was throwing me off apps I should have done better I, I mean MCAS so much I should have really done better Right. Did you have any questions around MCAS? Two. I had one. It was really, it was a, I think it was an easier one. Yeah, and the rest governance, of- I couldn't even tell you. I was guessing. <laughs> At that point, I was guessing. Like, I, they all sound right. How did you do on time? I actually, there were 10 questions that I marked as go back and review. And by the way, I've got a, I've got a, uh, uh, a rule. Don't second guess yourself unless you're absolutely sure you should go back and change it. That was what got me through my CSP, I think. Your mm-hmm. first guess is most likely the right answer. So don't change. Um, but I I had about five minutes left at the end of the whole thing. How, I, how did you do for time? I completed the exam in 20 minutes. <laughs> you're lying or you're awesome. I don't <laughs> no, know which no, one it is. No, 20 I'm minutes. Like, how, can, how can you have five minutes left on the test, Brody? Mike, that's that's like slow. The test administrator is like, Everything okay? You need help? You got to raise your hand. Like, no, I'm done. My test administrator luckily did not give me a hard time about talking to myself out loud, trying to step through a lot of these. Because usually I'm like, don't say anything. The test administrator's got the mic live. And I'm like, okay. Oh, and I'm like talking to myself, trying to like work through it. And they, they were good about it, which is great. So yeah, they don't like it when you pull that tablet out the back of your pants either. <laughs> no, they I'm slowly really looking at that. I'm trying to figure out what they I can get away with more and more, like using an external monitor, but having my surface away, you know, clean desk, sure. But like, how about a mint? How about a glass of water? Like I'm slowly introducing <laughs> variables to see what I can get away with over the course of the test. Figuring anyway. out how small he can write on a mint. All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, since you've already passed AZ-104, now you just have to go and take it again. You've got a very open, good chance of open book test. Time. It was an open book test in the summer if I had uh, re He's got to take it again. He didn't, he didn't do the uh, renewal. Oh, okay. oh, you actually had to take the test again. Yeah, because I, I was oh, working was like suck. 10, 11 hours a day over yeah. those two months. And I was you basically said not... man. Give me your login. I would have done it for you. <laughs> Damn, I'll remember that for next time, Rod. Thanks. All right. Yeah, SC 200 is due in two years, so I'll, I'll get you to do that one. All right. <laughs> and that test is going to be so hard in two yeah, by years. Time, by the <laughs> time that rolls around, yeah. Yeah, that test is going to be hard. No, I mean, I think this is great. You guys got two two certs that you probably would have uh, not taken the time to get, but the competition. So this is great. It is great. Yes, the the real winners are both of us for actually completing it. So good on you, Ed. Good on you. Yeah. Actually, how many categories was it? Five. Well, there's five last time. Where did the oh? Because it was only three categories with SC two hundred, right? right. It's it's, four categories. It's a tie. I mean, total score is is a point. It's it's a tie. Yeah. Three and three, right? We sure. never did really div, div, determine a tiebreaker because we just somebody's going to win. <laughs> Nobody, everybody doesn't get a trophy, but we tied. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you pass. Yeah, I, I learned got, something. We got it. We yeah. got it. I can post it on LinkedIn now. Have you guys considered um, pouring a little gasoline on this game and setting <laughs> odds and letting your audience gamble on who they think will <laughs> win? Oh, man. I was, I was going to say, you all have cornered the market on Microsoft Security meets Sports Center, and you just need to double down on this <laughs> yeah. and have over unders on these things. I have weekly yeah. lead up calls where we're just talking shit to each other. Just like, oh, you're going down. How's your <laughs> IAM, bud? Like, oh, I don't God, think we have live, yeah. live action while you're taking the test. Oh, oh he's getting ready to choose C, B, and D. <laughs> Oh, well, Brody's going for another mint. There was actually a D all of the <laughs> above on my test. Uh, and I went for oh. it. I'm like, I was trying to think about it. I'm like, whatever, it's D, I'm a D all the answers. I'm picking that. That's got to Don't ever an leave an answer on an answer. It's the only rule. Don't ever yeah, leave just, an answer on an answer. Answer oh, it's exactly. something. Okay. So the 104 I, I, we have I, I, next. All right. I'll take it while we're doing the podcast. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll have to by tomorrow. Um, all right, let's the get to score? our esteemed hold on, guests. Hold on. Can, can, can you score 700 on the dot, or is it, that, is it only slightly over? You have on the dot? Okay, that's hilarious. Okay. Just wondering what the lowest score is. I okay. mean, I had no skin left. I was like... Well, well, this is, well we, we have to remember that this is the first time that Edward took the test and he passed, so it's not really a valid test. You know what? I can only tell you. You only kick a dog so many times when he bites, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> At least you're on time yeah. this time, Edward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I I had a frustrating series of events around our announcement of basic logs. And then people are going out there and using it as a cost saving mechanism, which is not, it's a feature enhancement to stay in line with the market, you know, uh, capabilities and sellers are going out to my, Oh yeah, we can save you. No, you can't. You this cannot the same price this out hundred percent. Yeah. It is a post sales logger <clears throat> logging architecture and logging rationalization exercise to go back and take an existing customer and as they understand the use value of their log start shrinking it down by what could be offset right so i'm telling everybody log analytics adx stay away from this basic stuff you're going to get yourself in trouble now rod has a different opinion but i can see it in his face uh, i do no i agree with you on basic logs uh the archive logs is the thing i i would I would talk customers into utilizing not ADX. ADX is a little bit more difficult for customers. Archive logs a little bit easier, better. And then you can pull that stuff in later. Well, it's supposed to be an easy button coming up. Like, yeah. Um, Good chat, boys. Uh, yeah. I, you, you're right. It's, it's a little bit more convoluted and the nuances of it when you need to sort of rehydrate the tables, have some costs, they shouldn't be significant. And if you got to bring in two, three years where you got bigger problems. Yeah. You well, hopefully it's, atomic hopefully it's just, yeah, hopefully it's just an audit or compliance. If it's That's an actual compliance. issue, then yeah, then you have problems. The, the, the problem is the guys like you who are super smart and me and Brody and Trent, if, if we're having problems with it, this is not being unchallable to the sales force. They can't get it. Yeah. I mean, they're behind yeah. the curb, and that's not fair. It's not cool to put somebody out there like that. And it's not fair to have me to come in and have to backtrack and seem as though I'm undercutting them. Like, nah, that's not how it really works. So, but hey, we can get to a B&M all day and moaning and whining and stuff. But like, we got two guests that are part two of a part three series from a security vendor that I'm, I'm a fan of. I have a little bit of a relationship with two of the individuals that are part of Red Canary, who is our special guest, a Microsoft partner. I do believe they're part of Microsoft MISA. And I'll let them uh, talk about one aspect of the company, uh, which I am familiar with. Didn't get to use a lot of that but until I started getting into the Sentinel stuff um, and understanding XDR when I started, when I moved into this role. Um, and so, we talked about the Red Canary partnership with Microsoft when uh, Joe and Cordell came on and they highly recommended that we get the, the Atomic Red team to come on to talk about the, the queries and the hunting and the repositories that they put out for everybody to use. I know I'm not doing justice, so that's why we're gonna have our guest, Adam. Uh, Adam, I'm gonna butcher your name if you don't stop me. No, you're good. I was waiting stop. for it. I was like, come on, go for it. You can Matt do Giannini? it. Matt Matchachi, Matchachi, Matchachi. I've heard everything under the sun, and I appreciate all of it. It's the best. It's <laughs> it's Machinchi, but Machinchi. hey, you just keep swinging for it, and I, it's it's great because everybody benefits from my last name being non-trivial to sign down. <laughs> so. Hey man, I'm from the south. You know the quality of our education. <laughs> <laughs> we were at a we were at a store and our, so Red Canary is located in Denver and, and Adam and I were at a store and there's like this 22 year old person who's working the counter at the store and Adam's saying his name he's like Mash like the TV show and I'm like Adam yeah it's <laughs> this person has no idea what Mash is it, and you're like oh, it went longer than the war people come on you don't know yeah. what Mash the TV so I have to say Mash like the potato now if you're like oh big shout out Ed and Al, uh, Alan Alder if you're listening man security brother come on over here. <laughs> So the next person I can definitely introduce them, Brian Donahue. Um, and they are from Red Hello. Canary, and they are also part of the Atomic Red team. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, you guys can decide who goes first to introduce yourself a little bit better, and then you can jump into the topic. Um, as you guys are making the intro, I'm going to ask the question that I have up front. 
So it'll be the first thing. How did you come up with Atomic Red Team? <laughs> awesome. So yeah, I, I'll I'll start because I was unmuted and Brian had to go the extra inch to you know unmute. Um. So uh, yeah, I'm Adam Machinchi. I'm the d- director of open source programs here at Red Canary, and Brian and I are both in the community department. My focus is on open source programs, obviously. Um. And so one way to think about me is I'm kind of like the head of product, but for the open source initiatives. So, you know, all of the other open source stuff we have, although Atomic Red Team is the largest, I help make sure that those things are on rails and uh, have a good direction and have goals and have growth and that the community is being built out and all those sorts of things. And so that's that's me and uh, what I do. Um, as far as how the name Atomic Red Team came up, I actually think it would probably be better for like Brian to introduce himself and provide a bit of context because Brian's been at Red Canary longer th- than I have. So yeah, Brian, to you. Just throwing me right under the bus. Um, I'm, so, glad, yeah, I'm glad I, everybody caught that. that was yeah, just... I am Brian Donahue. Um, I, I'm a, the principal security specialist on the community team at Red Canary. So I, I focus on um, like producing educational content that sort of helps security folks uh, wrap their heads around things like uh, detection engineering, um, threat intelligence, uh, now increasingly atomic red team incident handling, sort of all, all sorts of different disciplines of security that sort of uh, people need help sort of learning more about. Um, so to answer your question, I, I honestly, so atomic red team started, I think in 2017. So that would have been like a full year before I joined red canary. Um, as far as I know, like, uh, the red team aspect of it is the most obvious, right? So, I mean, it's a library of tests that are designed to simulate um, like attacks, right? So th- there's your red team aspect of it. Um, and it was initially designed because <laughs> when we would go out to customers, uh, they would be like, hey, we, we executed TrickBot or whatever uh, on our machine. And like, you know, our antivirus caught it. Well, what the heck is the point of Red Canary? And we were like, well, like, what if it wasn't TrickBot? Like, what if TrickBot had a different signature, right? Like, you need to think about the behaviors that the other parts of this threat or like follow-on threats exhibit, right? So we built this library of atomic tests, right? Individual uh, behaviors that adversaries exercise in the process of a cyber attack. And the point of that being like, yeah, you might be able to catch known malware but like if i throw that malware into a cryptor and run it at you again now it's undetectable and now you have to be able to detect like these behaviors so it's atomic as in like individual small characteristics of a of an attack um and then red team uh obviously is just a, a reference to the fact that it's kind of a red team exercise that is that's a great explanation um, great explanation the atomic is to the granularity of that you can do your inspection. So atomic, right? Not destructive potential. <laughs> yeah. And Adam yeah, is constantly reminding me when I'm coming up with like off the, off the wall ideas. I'm like, and we could string these seven tests together and make one major test. And he's like, it's atomic red team, Brian. Atomic, yeah, the, remember, the, atomic the red no, team. One of the number one requests we get is like, okay, you all have tests for all of these miter attack techniques individually. Cool but I want to test for APT 41 and I want to string this stuff together and I want to chain and inputs and outputs and I want to use it with my blue team all the time. And so it's like, cool. So what you want is like a chained blue team test, not an atomic red team test. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess that's what I want. It's like, cool. That's not what this is. <laughs> and, and, and part of that is, is by design, right? We could increase the spec of this open source library of stuff to include whatever we want. But part of what makes Atomic Red Team special, in, in, at least in my mind, is that it's easy enough that anybody can commit a test to this thing. It's, like, it's driven entirely by the community. Red Canary staff commits the minority of commits to this by a pretty substantial margin. And it's that driven by the world of just like, hey, I know MITRE ATT&CK and I know some stuff adversaries do. I'm just going to throw some a line of code and some YAML. Welcome, you're now an Atomic Red Team contributor. And that's what we're always striving for. It's just like, yeah, stranger on the internet, come on in. Welcome it's it's also community. incredibly easy to use, right? So like, yeah, we could rev the engine on this thing. There could be a C2 component of it, right? Like it could be, it could be turned into something that's like dual use and kind of like something that would be useful, not only to defenders in, in problematic ways, like other tools that we're all familiar with. Um, but like the fact that you can just go into the repo, 
literally copy and paste a command or copy a command, paste it into command shell or PowerShell, hit enter and run like a pretty much completely innocuous test on a machine is super helpful, right? Like not only is it helpful for a sophisticated team that wants to do like continual validation that their visibility and collection and detection is all working the way they think it is, but it's also super useful for like, if you've got junior analysts and you're trying to teach them like, hey, what does malicious look like in EDR data? Like you can run these super simple tests and they'll just show you like, hey, look, this is a, an encoded PowerShell command. Like this is what it looks like when your EDR sensor picks it up. Um, so I think that that atomic aspect of it makes it much more approachable to, to like a wider uh, array of people. So, mm. yeah, I mean, one of the things that you guys don't know is Listeners know, but I was involved in developing the labs for the SC200 course. Um, and if you go out to GitHub, uh, when when I was looking at setting up the the attacks that they would then use Sentinel to see, um, I said I have to make sure that you know what is my learning objective here for them to respond to a complex attack chain or understand what's going on with Sentinel, how it's detecting things, and, and very focused in what the learning objective was. So believe it or not, actually out there in the lab material, um, you'll see a link out to your uh, GitHub. Um, and I actually, so I gave you credit here. Uh, the attack patterns are based on open source project, um, calling that out. Um, and then I went through and said, okay, um, you know, we want to add a persistent registry key, a, um, you know, adding a user to the uh, local administrators. Um, also, I modified the C2 that you guys had out there specific for what we were doing, uh, right? So then, um, so then they could actually understand. So I, I, the instructors explain the attacks that are taking place, giving you guys credit. Um, and then the students go ahead and perform the attacks. Um, and one of this is like, you know, what can be seen by um, uh, Sentinel, what can be seen by Defender for Endpoint, uh, what can be seen with uh, Sysmon uh, and what's available to you. So they actually go out and they perform the attacks um, in the different scenario or different endpoints uh, that are out there. Um, and then they go through Sentinel um, and write the detections to actually go out there in the process of, of seeing the detection, right? So they're gonna go out and Sentinel and say, search for startup.bat, right? Because we know that that's what we used. So they know what they're looking for, but they're actually developing um, developing how they're, they're um, building out the detections by knowing what they've done from the sample attacks that are coming from, uh, from your open source project um, and then building out um, what they're going from there. So a, a funny story that happened in the development of this was, um, you know, we have Sysmon and we also have um, just the, um, uh, the connector for Sentinel on a machine. Um, and then we have uh, Defender for Endpoint. By the time, so I ran this where they would check out for the uh, local, uh, uh, a user being added to the uh, local group administrators. And so when we're developing the courseware, I added in this, you could actually see it in Defender for Endpoint and also uh, from uh, the Sentinel connector. Um, and by the time it was being tested, Microsoft for some reason decided that Defender for Endpoint no longer cared about users being added to the local administrators group out of nowhere. So that actually had to get cut out of the courseware. So I think that this is an awesome learning tool, uh, especially when you know what the attack is gonna look like and you're learning how to utilize Sentinel to go ahead and, and uh, find uh, these things. As a matter of fact, their, uh, their hunting queries actually go and find the C2, that graphic there for, uh, for, the, um, for the beaconing out so then they can learn how to go about doing that and, to the graphic and dealing with time and all that other fun stuff. So yeah, people that have taken this class and have done the labs, you're already using um, using your work here. So so, it's, so it's that's awesome. that, that's that's Frank's way of asking for a T-shirt. By the way, 
Oh, I we'll, like a t-shirt we'll too. You, we'll I mean, send yeah, you guys some, some t-shirts. That's not a problem. Like that I will say, like, I know you guys talked to our pal Joe Savini um, when you talked to, to Cordell and, and Joe like a, probably two, three weeks ago. It's funny because Joe Savini and I went through like kind of this exact same exercise for a video series we made where we basically went in and I ran these tests on my VM. Like we have a bunch of custom tests that we built for this thing called the threat detection report, which we'll probably talk about at some point. Um, but so we built all these custom tests for it and then we ran them on my VM and then Joe and I jumped on, uh, on a Zoom call and recorded it and went through and he basically hunted for the activity. Um, and so it's funny because it's like, it's almost ex like an exact uh, mimic of this, albeit in, in, um, in visual form. And I also find it hilarious, like when I, I don't ever really interface with, with anyone from Microsoft, but I do find it interesting when they turn off an alert for something. Cause it's like, what was the calculus on that? Right? Like how much was that thing costing at Microsoft scale that they're like, you know, we're not going to generate an alert for that anymore. It's just local admin. Like what can you do with local admin on an endpoint? Just not see something to do with passwords or something like that. <laughs> I, hope um, none of, I hope none of Brody's customers are listening to that. So, <laughs> so yeah, this is, this is the uh, site here. So basically went out and, and I guess you have everything done by the MITRE ATT&CK uh, outlines here. Yeah, we, we sort it all by a MITRE ATT&CK ID. And so th there, is a, there is a barrier to entry for this, which is you have heard the words MITRE ATT&CK before, and you have a relative idea of how to explore that. Uh, but, but nowadays, especially after the last few RSAs, we think everybody has enough MITRE ATT&CK in their eyeballs that they probably have another way around these numbers a little bit. This is a justification for people to use Sysmon running through all this stuff versus just uh, Defender for Endpoint. Look at that, we're throwing his arms up in the air. This is a constant uh, talk that we have, Defender for Endpoint. Do you, do you need to also have Sysmon in, uh, on top of Defender for Endpoint? And my answer is always yes, because, because I know what I'm getting versus Defender for Endpoint deciding, oh, we don't care about the local admin group anymore. You're like, hey, why not? You know? I um, Go ahead. Sysmon Rick, is also 100% free, right? Defender for Endpoint, you got to pay for E5 or E6 licenses or, or whatever. Six. I don't know. But <laughs> well, yeah, you guys. Well, Brian, let me ask you a question. Since you seem to be a, a, a Sysmon fan, does your product work with Sysmon being the sole endpoint logging thing? You're saying that it can operate alone. You guys can still do the same type of stuff. Or do you need Sysmon and I, MD? I, I, I get, but no, it, their stuff doesn't. Their stuff is just a tax to generate data into the logs for you then to check your processes to see if if Defender for Endpoint's gonna collect the data and you're able to see the attack and the same thing for Sysmon. So I asked the question I don't think context. That's... I asked that question wasn't really geared for this team. It was really geared toward Joe and Cardell, right? Well, no. I can answer that question. And the answer is okay. no. We do not support Sysmon as an EDR agent at Red Canary. But Brian personal like person who likes learning about security. I like Sysmon. Now, I don't know how feasible it is to build an entire security program around Sysmon. Like I just run Olaf's Sysmon configuration and I throw tests at a VM that I don't care about. And then I go and find the telemetry that's generated in Sysmon in, in accordance with those tests. Um, and it's great. Uh, and also like the, the, Another cool thing is the threat detection report that we're about to release, which is the annual report I referenced a minute ago. Um, like we rank and stack these most pre prevalent MITRE attack techniques according to Red Canary's detections across the year. Um, and like each technique includes a test, uh, multiple tests for a lot of them, but at least one test that will exercise that technique. And then it also includes like, hey, here are the Sysmod event IDs that will pull relevant data that you can build detection with, um, like based on that. So we'll be like, you know, mm -hmm. you want to watch for process creation events, right? So you want Sysmon ID one or whatever it is. Um, and we kind of build that all out and also include like, hey, if you wanted to build det a detector for it, like you might want to look for a process that is word spawning a process that is, that is PowerShell. So Sysmon is top of mind for me right now. Um, I also... I love running tests against Defender for Endpoint and going and looking through there as well. Like I find both of them to be fascinating ways of learning kind of like how malicious activity manifests um, in these various data sources. So to our listeners, the key takeaway from this is ASR, attack surface reduction. Otherwise, Brian is going to see you and you won't see him. 
<laughs> so we got to, you better turn on ASR to our listeners out there. Do it. Well, and it's but funny. Edward, it, what oh, about ahead. all of the Excel files out there that contain macros that run entire enterprise organizations? A I mean, a we ASR. can't get rid of those. Yeah. Once again, let me let me correct. It's ASR rules that Edward's talking about here, not just ASR, because ASR is ASR a... rules. Right. Because you can turn on to have everything in audit mode or whatever the the, the different configuration. I'm I'm talking yeah. about straight up block. Yeah. I don't care what your little Microsoft Access macros you had running. <laughs> they don't work anymore. So yeah, but yeah. it's funny it's too, because we we get people in the community because we have a Slack channel that you know are the entire Atomic Red Team communities in, and we get contributors in there and the whole thing, and people asking questions. And every once in a while we'll be like, hey, uh, you know, defenders catching everything, all my atomic tests, what should I do? And I was like, What do you mean? What should you do? Like, good, that's that's what this is here for, right? These are these are giving you table stakes to just kick the tires on an EDR and is like, does this do I get any bells and whistles? Like these are these are de designed to be benign, but you should see these things happening, right? They're examples. They're not there to. And and actually, I could uh, I could share a screen here for a second. We could put some visualization of what Brian was talking about earlier. We um the goal the goal. Oh, yeah, the let's host. see if I can. And and to uh to Brian and Adam, if you see us looking away, we're not being rude. There's Twitch on one side, Discord on the other. So everybody saw the man. No, it's all right. We know you're playing your Fortnite with each other while you're talking to us. Like, I'm playing Destiny too. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I, I, for the record, I have a serious Destiny problem right now. So, oh, dude, oh, very okay, insensitive we got... of you to bring that up. <laughs> let's park that. That's gonna be yeah. Let's park that. But me too. What a great expansion! Just beat the last raid. Love it. Anyway, let's, let's keep going here. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. Uh, that, this podcast has gone off the rails. Let's back <laughs> it up, folks. Uh, no, I was going to say, it's because Atomic Red Team, we find more and more is like this weird glue between all these different worlds of like Microsoft training and EDR testing and Sysmon learning and like attack simulation emulation software products that have integrated Atomic Red Team. And that's the, that's the world I come from is building attack and emulation simulation software. That's where I learned about Atomic Red Team. Um, and we had an Atomic Red Team feature. It was, it's that kind of thing. Um, but it's funny when we talk to people who are like, hey, like, tell me how to use Atomic Red Team. Where do I get started? We, we tend to point people to this, which is the threat detection report. This is last year's. Um, and again, it's this idea of like table stakes. So you can hover over techniques, Oh, here's all the top techniques. Let's just go ahead and take a look. Okay, number one, command scripting interpreter. Very cool. This is all our PowerShell. We'll jump to that. And here's PowerShell. And then you can click on the testing button. And then, hey, look, an Atomic Red Team logo and bang. Here's a one-liner that you can copy and paste. And again, table stakes. This is just encoded PowerShell. Do you see this happen? Yes or no? You know, if, if encoded PowerShell runs on someone in the marketing department's laptop, you should probably know about that, right? Like it doesn't need to be an O-Day, that's just a thing. And look, there's a link off to a test in Atomic Red Team and bang, here's the example again. And there's a page full of these things. And Adam, this seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the yeah. you, well, the crazy thing is though, like, yeah, you should be aware of encoded PowerShell running in your environment, right? And I, like, I, I don't know, I haven't run that test in a while, but Microsoft may or may not um, generate an alert based on this, but at a certain point, like, I realized that I was running it in some tool and it would generate it if I ran this in command prompt, but if I ran it interactively in PowerShell, it wouldn't pick it up, right? So like there's these little nuanced differences that like you don't like, you just don't, the, the, the assumptions that you make about the ways that tools work aren't always correct, right? And maybe it's because I'm ignorant and someone else could explain why an interactive PowerShell gets doesn't get picked up and proxying it through command does, but like, like these little things that like they make you learn like i learn things every day just running these silly little tests and to further make it easier for people it, it, we, one thing we did with microsoft is we have atomic red team in the emulation lab now. so for those folks who have this there's some atomic red team logos in there and we just provided scripts that are built off of atomic red team tests that can be and brian actually did a great little post on this but look defender for endpoint how about that and like, literally, it was so easy to use. He made a GIF out of it. And here it is in like eight seconds. You go to the place, you click the thing, you double click the thing and you're done. And look, Defender lit up, right? It was, it's that simple to do. And you don't need to go pay a ton of money for some adversarial thing. Just do you notice this? Yes or no? 
Love it. That's fantastic. That's good stuff. And it's built right in, as you're showing on the demo there, it's built right into the security.microsoft.com portal. So you can go into the attack simulations area and you can leverage these to actually light up your environment, whether it's test environment, whether it's your first time prod to make sure things are working. It's one thing to say, okay, we've got everything configured, but it's another thing to actually see these things light up in the portal and teach people uh, in terms of what's going to happen and then how, how maybe your automation is built out to, so, to uh, detect and remediate against these types of things. So it's super straightforward, right? It seems like a no-brainer, gentlemen. Great work. So quick question, Brody. I'm, I'm actually looking over into my, um, my MDE environment. Where is it? Is it in the tutorials or the simulations catalog? You might have to have demo mode turned on, but it should be in the evaluations and tutorials. Yeah. Um, tab okay okay i may have to go into demo mode because i'm looking at it, i don't see it but uh i'll find it edward i don't have it in front of me right now but it's in I there see. i i thought i saw it <clears throat> and i can see the scenarios powershell script and follows attack automated back door so blah 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 and some of those well, we have a like... question here what what is i think we have a question here on the chat what is encoded powershell well, what, what are you talking to us for? You all should probably answer that question better than, than us yahoos. <laughs> like, um, you know, we, we know, yeah, you all can dive in. We can answer the question, but I think it's no, better. No, go, ahead, for... go ahead, go ahead, and answer you're the, the question. You're the guest, Adam, go ahead. Yeah. You're the guest, we have questions in the chat here. So they're asking you. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, uh, encoded PowerShell is in this, the example we showed earlier, a PowerShell command that's been wrapped up and encoded. So it's not human readable in the form that it is entered at and it becomes readable once it executes like that. It kind of unfolds in the background and, you know, begins the behaviors you have designed for it. But it's like cool because space 64 encoded, is it? Correct. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Um, but, but what's fun about that is we see this all the time where, uh, people will design alarms based on the strings of these commands themselves. And encoded PowerShell just breaks those immediately because it's the behavior you care about, not necessarily like the exact string of the command. So, you, you, yeah. you literally just add a flag to the PowerShell command that is dash encoded, but it can be any iteration from dash E to dash encoded command. So it can be dash E, dash EN, dash ENC, dash ENC, O. So if you want to build a detection for it, you have to build a detector that will iterate on every single iteration of that and understand all of them. And so like, I've never been a system administrator. I can't for the life of me, Matt, I can think of one example of why you might want to encode a PowerShell command. And that's like, maybe if you're passing credential material or something super sensitive through PowerShell, like, Maybe you encode it there, but like, as the detection engineers at Red Canary have told me, who are much smarter about this stuff than I am, like they always say, look, encoded PowerShell commands aren't always malicious, but like, it's not going to hurt you to just keep a lookout for any encoded PowerShell command. Like maybe there's some software that does it. So you create an exclusion for whatever that wacky software is, but like, you know, just looking for encoded PowerShell commands, it's probably the thing we detect almost more than anything else. Like we probably, and I think we've said that in every- It is, yeah, report. that's, yeah, yeah we, we say that uh, right here. And, and to your point about like the things you need to flag on, right? We actually enumerate those as far as like, there's a lot of wacky ways that you can run in encoded PowerShell. Um, and, and these are all completely valid. And here's the stats behind, uh, at, at least in what we've been monitoring, the ways in which we see people execute those kind of encoded PowerShell commands. And they're bonkers, <laughs> like it just, there's weird stuff. And and yes, I theoretically, it's not always malicious, but getting an alert on these things sure can hurt, especially in environments where no one has any business running encoded PowerShell on them. In a, right. A terminal call. And frankly, you're better than this than I am from 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 a red team background deeper than mine. Is a layman's term that you know in, in, encoded PowerShell looks to be a non-interactive user, where it looks as though a person is not doing it. It looks like a process is doing it. Am I in the same room where they were Frank? Saying no, that, 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 that oh, okay, you can I'm still right. have an, you can still have somewhat of an interactive login and still running encoded PowerShell, so you can do PowerShell remoting. Get onto the box, still do the encoded PowerShell, and but you can always turn off AMZ by corrupting PowerShell, anyways. And so it's yeah. better to go ahead and uh, look for this in your uh, logs and not be dependent upon AMZ to uh, catch anything strange. 
that said, we probably, I mean, I don't know, again, not a detection engineer, but if I, if I were gambling, I would say that a very large percentage of the encoded PowerShell that we detect um, is automated in some fashion and probably not a human doing that uh, directly. Although I'm sure some of it is, but I would guess that a lot of it is automated as well. Okay. Encoded strings are also, uh, you know, way to pass files back and forth, uh, stuff like that. So th there's reasons to use encoding and, and also mm -hmm. a lot of people know that that's being looked for. So they're writing their own encoder decoder that doesn't make sense to, uh, to it's not base 64 encoded. It's the hackers have done on themselves to hide what they're doing. So yeah. well, uh, ironically, another thing we talk about in the threat detection report is like some adversaries go to such great lengths to, to obfuscate their payloads that they end up just drawing attention to themselves. Cause it's like, like you look at some things and you're like, this is not normal. There's no way a normal human would ever <laughs> do something like this. And then and yeah. at the end of the day, the thing is still like, deleting encrypting and exfilling files you're like oh got you in the behavior as usual nice right, right? like mm -hmm. does it you know th this is that whole like post-exploitation assumed breach model that you know we, we bang the drum about where it's like just look for what their actual end goal is catch them there and but as it turns out people do wacky crazy encoded payloads catch those too because they're just weird true very true. So let me ask you guys, I'm, you know, I'm looking across here, looking at some of your stuff. I'm looking at your main page. I'm looking at you guys. I think I asked this to Joe. Do you guys have a way to measure how many people are actually using your stuff? Or is you guys relying on how many draw uh, pulls from, from Git or downloads from Git? Oh, now you're squarely in my neck of the woods about KPIs for open source land projects. Um, one of the fun things is Atomic Red Team is not software, right? It's not, there's no way we could bake something in there to see how many folks are using it. And so defining the success and health of something, of a library of examples like Atomic Red Team is kind of weird to do. And stars are okay, forks are okay, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the, the success metrics, like the KPIs that we have for Atomic Red Team are about people viewing the, the repo, just going to it any you know, unique views to the thing. Um, how many new PRs, like new contributions we get, you know, monthly or quarterly or whatever, and how many new contributors we have. Those, those are the three and you need all three, right? Because if we have lots of people viewing the site, but not a lot of contributions, you can predict that the site's gonna drop because its popularity is gonna go down because its usefulness is gonna go down. Or, you know, if we hire a full-time staffer to contribute to Atomic Red Team, well, we have lots of contributions, but not a lot of new people in the ecosystem. So that's probably not healthy, right? Or if you have uh, like all sorts of new people and they're contributing a lot, but the site traffic is still dropping, well, maybe there's a really small subset or an ecosystem that really likes this thing, but its general popularity is kind of failing. So those are the three metrics and all three need to be going up to say, yep, this is pretty healthy, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. It, you know, it, you... The way Red Canary and the Atomic Red Team <clears throat> are positioned is not unique, but not a lot of people do it. So I'm sure there's a bunch of marketing dollars for your Red Canary piece, and you guys are really open sources. But when things were normal, when you went out and you did trade shows, did you guys act as a unified entity, or did you guys have separate booths in, inside your things? Uh, I, I'm so glad you asked this question because, so I've been a Red Canary for a long time, right? Like back when Red Canary was kind of a baby company, we're much better known now, but back in the before times in like 2018, and this was really before I had wrapped my head around Atomic Red Team, it existed. Like we had this applied research team that did crazy witch science with, with, uh, with Atomic Red Team that I didn't totally understand at the time. I, in retrospect, I realized that it was all a lot simpler than I thought it was. Um, but like we would be, I'd be standing at a booth and someone would come up and be like, hey, you guys are the Atomic Red Team guys. And we'd be like, yeah. And then there'd be this weird dance where you'd have to be like, yes, now let us tell you about this other thing that is not Atomic Red Team called Managed Detection and Response. So like <laughs> Atomic Red Team was a tremendous brand recognition thing for us and continues to be. And I'm very curious to see like now that we're, we're going back out into the real world and breathing the same air as other humans. I, I, like, I'm very, very curious to see if people still, like if, if brand recognition for Red Canary is still kind of 
like it's probably not dominated by Atomic Red team, um, but if it, if that's still a really meaningful way for people to know who Red Canary is, yeah, Brian, I'll come no, to your never booth had if you got boots. t-shirts. Okay, yeah, I'll yeah, come yeah to your dude, boots if you, you got shirts. t-shirts. The, yeah. the, <laughs> I, I I will go ahead and confess, and I had not really heard of Red Canary. I'm sorry, um, Atomic Red team until like two and a half years ago, maybe. I was up in D.C. and I was at a, a Capture the Flag event, Net Wars Sans GX course, and people had the shirt on. Oh, cool shirt right there, right? Um, so I, I, I thought it was something else at the time, but I, now that I did a little bit of research, I'm like, oh, okay, I see what these guys are. There's some open source thing. It, I never really connected you to Red Canary. I thought you guys were passion projects of the company, not really just dug in there. But um, it's, it, I forget the term that once you see something, you become acutely aware of where you see it. <laughs> so now, now when I see something, oh, yeah, I know those guys over there. Pretty good. You know, so we talked about KPIs and, and, and stuff like that and measuring this right here. Has there been, has anyone ever came to you to say, and I hope I'm not opening a can of worms here, how do we monetize this? I knew that that's exactly yeah, I was right waiting for it. Adam, I would like to buy one Atomic Red Team, please. <laughs> and, and actually, just a quick anecdote, because we're talking about the before times thing. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I used to do adversary emulation software and I actually helped design a feature set around Atomic Red Team at a not Red Canary company. Uh, so there were these moments at those kind of conferences to be like, hey, if you walk over to what was apparently Brian Donahue and the rest of the Red Canary team at their booth and I give them a duffel bag and hold up a duffel bag of money and say, can I buy an Atomic Red Team from you? Their answer is going to be no but I could sell you that because it's a feature set of this software, right? And so mm -hmm. there are other organizations actually monetizing the use of this thing. Um, and Red Canary is not one of them, which is interesting enough, right? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting conundrum to be in because your popularity is that you're doing the good work, your good stuff, and you better, you're bettering the security landscape and posture and helping guys like us out. But... It, 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 and had you not said that you're seeing people that are taking this and then building out a monetized offering of it, right? And and totally obfuscating and purposely obfuscating that, you know, this is free, right? Right. But I think they would probably have to bundle it on to some MDR or a, a pro a, a reoccurring uh, uh, red team type activities that you would buy into. I can already hear my wheels spinning. Like, you know what? I could do that. I can just take their stuff get a couple guys to go in and say we do continuous pen testing or vulnerability testing in your environment right uh, not that i would frankly no, but it's would. fair like there are teams <laughs> and software and there are people who, who do exactly that and it's not hard like from a from a feature perspective atomic red team is just a library of commands right one feature you build around that is a gui hey look instead of you copying and pasting these things or running them and wherever just click that button and it'll detonate over there. And that's, mm -hmm. if you look and you find the products out there that exist today that have atomic red team integrations, they're all just like wrapped in GUIs. Oh, look, we'll generate a payload for you and it'll generate all these tests and mm -hmm. chain them together and all those sorts of things. Like all the models you're talking about that you're thinking of, those exist today as feature well, sets. For the, the good thing that you that the world should hear. So if anybody's listening and have done this, realize that, you know, Adam and Brian own the keys. You know, you guys are just copying their gets and putting it out. Anytime they cut you off, you know, they, and that's funny because a lot of people thought Git was going to bite the dust after the acquisition is going to be ruined by Microsoft, right? And that didn't occur, at least to my knowledge, it hasn't occurred, right? And so uh, I, I think that the open source lends to true security practitioner nerves who feel the legitimacy of it. Like these guys are doing it as a passion. So they are putting it in. They're not trying to monetize it. I think it would be a bad thing if you don't have really pointed focus and a mission to all of a sudden say, oh, it's not free anymore, right? That, that would be catastrophic to the following and, and stuff, right? But I like it. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Matter of fact, as you were saying that, I found a company that's doing exactly what you said. I looked over here and, and that's what they're doing. And, and to directly address your question, like, yes, it has come up a thousand million bazillion times. Why don't you guys sell? Why don't we sell Red Can or why don't we sell Atomic Red Team? And the answer is like, I don't know. Like, that's a question for the leadership who have decided not to do it. And it's a great choice. Uh, I don't think there's any threat of it ever not being open source. Like the thing you would cool. sell would be like, the service 
to run the tests or yeah. the agent that you install that that can like proxy the execution of them. Um, like the library of tests itself, I don't think anyone would ever close that down. Like yeah, and arguably it'd be community. really diminished in value if we closed it up. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And it, I think your leadership recognizes that. I, I don't know. I can't read their minds, but it seems like this is a win-win a situation for everybody, not only the leadership team, but also the security community at large. Yeah. And we're and we're really fortunate at Red Canary. As a company, we take this community effort really seriously to the point where Brian and I are in the community department. Um, we are not nested underneath marketing. We are not nested underneath products. Like that, we are our own thing in the company and we have our own initiatives we have our own you know okrs and kpis and goals and they're based on doing the most good and showing that we know what we're talking about and trying to create novel stuff and just you know trying to help the information security community as a whole and and, and that makes sense things is yeah. we like we have a, a group of maintainers of atomic red team right and they are the ones who approve the tests merge them into the repo. I am spitballing here and I but I think only one of them is a Red Canary employee. Only the one. other one, two, three, four, four, four or five are all non yeah. Red Canary employees, right? So like th this thing is not like sure. Red Canary could be like, you know what? We're closing it off. You know, we're gonna we're gonna go private with this thing, but we would lose all of the the brilliant people who have made it great, and we would lose all the community contributions that actually stand up the tool. I mean, way back in the day, we held this thing up, we maintained it, we contributed most of the tests. Those days are long gone. Yeah. long gone. Well, like seriously, the the uh, the awesome group of maintainers we have. Again, only one of them is works as a Red Canary staffer. They keep this thing alive. They are the ones who drive it. They are the one who do make sure that nothing crazy or malicious gets in there. And it's the community that drives all the development. You know, Brian and I are here to write blogs about it and hand out t-shirts and to bring it to RSA and wave flags around and, you know, make sure that everything stays on rails and that you try to get the resources and support when people need it. But it's the community that drives Atomic the, right? through and through. The beauty, the beauty of the maintainers is they come from like a wide variety of big and well-known companies running very prestigious security teams and they develop, they, they focus on making atomic red team like meet their needs. Right. So like we've got these people with these disparate needs and these disparate wants for atomic red team and they're driving where it goes. And then you amplify that out across the community. And that is way better than me saying, I like to use it because it teaches me what malicious looks like. Or, mm -hmm. you know, the early Red Canary folks saying we like to use it because either it validates like what we assume about our detection coverage or it helps us show customers like the added value you get from doing active detection with an EDR agent over, you know, just having an AV doing prevention, right? So mm -hmm. like there's all these people with all these different use cases and they're all applying that into Atomic Red Team and just making it a more robust and better tool in the process. Uh, I don't know the actual... How many tests do you have that are Azure specific now? Adam has a, a scripty do that he, he I do. I do. Have, I have exactly a scripty do that'll tell me exactly that. Uh, okay, so, so you're allowed to doing, give an approximation, but okay. Yeah, well, you got uh, he's doing yeah. that. I want to make a comment is that what you guys are doing are very commendable. I, and I don't know the exact age of, uh, of, of atomic red team, but 17, yeah. 2017, you were yeah. probably at the point of no return or trying to monetize because they <laughs> think Docker how that fiasco happened, right? People are used to it free and all of a sudden, oh yeah, we need to figure out how to charge for it, right? Um, and, 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 but, and you also made another comment is that uh, you, you're separate, you're not part of marketing and everything else. Best believe you're part of marketing, right? Your, your, your personalities and yourself is, is together. You just don't hit their P&L. <laughs> That's all it is, <laughs> right? But definitely you say, you know, a, a, you know, ART, art and then you immediately think oh red canary right and that's how i think of it right i've never really thought of you guys as a separate entity i always thought that this was the community give back for red canary right and and and, and 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 your reputation is actually pretty good even in some places that are very scrutinizing think agency government stuff like that that laugh at people that do windows and, and they think i think mde is getting a better reputation right frank it's getting a little bit better reputation 
Oh no, definitely getting a better reputation. Yeah, right up there, top right square. I would I will say as Adam is searching for Azure tests, we the newest like area that we've jumped into with Atomic Red Team, I think and I think it's the newest is like sort of doing these cloud tests. Um, and then in fact, we brought on, we expanded our, our maintainers team by, I don't know, 40% to bring in people who like live and breathe this sort of testing um, of cloud services. So it's still kind of in its infancy. I am interested to hear if, if, if Adam is able to pull these stats out of the yeah. repo. He's like sweating profusely yeah, as his script yeah. breaks. <laughs> Yeah, it's so the cloud stuff in particular is still very young in the Atomic Red Team world. So, for example, we have like over 600 atomic tests for Windows as like a thing, right? But we have between Azure AD specific tests and like uh, cloud tests, like a dozen tests. It's not a lot. We need we need love in that department, basically. And and I think part of it is is um, the threat landscape and the adversarial landscape in the desktop environment is trodden around. Everybody plays there. Everybody knows there. It's easy for people to write tests for those things. Not everybody knows how adversaries think in an Azure environment. And well, that's to why that point, test... if you're listening right now and you do know yes. how adversaries play with Azure or GCP or whatever cloud environment you want to use, like go to Atomic Red Team write tests, reach out to Adam or I, we'll guide you on the way. Like we always want more contributors and like the audience of this, this podcast, this live stream are probably like the perfect people to help us. Correct. Expand the test coverage there. Love it. So Brian, you have 27. That sounds right. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, Adam, 27. Uh, for Azure specific stuff. No, just across all your, your clouds. Um, Across all cloud stuff, yeah, yeah, I can see AWS. Yeah, it's not. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. It's about. I think if you add all the clouds, I think you. Yeah, you're about twenty seven. Because yeah, I can see three distinct for AWS right off the bat. Yeah, it's it's not a lot. And then well, we break it out the way Mitre does by platform too. So there's there's infrastructure as a service. There's mm -hmm. containers. There's Azure AD. Um, and, and then sometimes you get some like weird, like Linux crossover -y stuff where there is actually a container -y thing, but also not. So it's kind of muddled a little bit by way of platform statistics, but yeah, it's, it's a dozen or two. It's not, a, it's not a ton. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the biggest thing that sort of throws me off, I, Office 365, I understand Azure AD, Google Workspace, IS, AWS, Azure GCP. And then you have some of, it was just say SaaS, Salesforce, MuleSoft. I don't, I don't know, right? I can't really tell. Yeah, we're but a little yeah, we're a little beholden to the way the, the miter structure is, and so yeah. SAS is kind of a nebulous term. But but you do attack. You do look at some things. It's like um, you know, just to, just because you're in the cloud doesn't mean you're not using L L SAS, right? And I, I think it's also important to remember that like Atomic Red Team was born out of Red Canary when we were fundamentally doing uh, detection on endpoints. As we've mm -hmm. sort of expanded beyond the endpoint, like the, the the tail of that is going to be Atomic Red Team following up with it, right? So like, as we invest more and more in sort of expanding our, our detection across different like non things that aren't endpoints, right? I expect the the testing to come in on the tail end of that. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I hope. Big shout out to Jose Hernandez and Bavian Patel as being maintainers. Come on to the show. Tell her what his life is like being a maintainer. <laughs> oh, they're listening, right? <laughs> And gentlemen, uh, we'll help you spread the word so we can get oh, yeah, some, sure. some more cloud-based tests because, I oh. mean, whatever we can do as a community to help grow, that, that, sounds, that sounds awesome. Yeah, and oh, you oh. get a t-shirt. When you contribute for your first your first contribution, you get a t-shirt out of it. You guys got a lot of t-shirts over oh, there. Oh, there are thousands, thousands given of t-shirts. So, you know, I mean, thousands of t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I want one. I want to be able to put it on. Matt, do you guys have stickers and stuff I can slap on my laptop? I need some of that stuff, too. Stickers. We, oh, you, yeah, you will all be that. receiving a package with stickers and t-shirts and whatever else we can give you. <laughs> Don't ship any of your bro. He's in Canada. They got oh, trucker my. issues up there, right? They can't get Not stuff Not anymore. Out. You're outrageous, Ed. <laughs> Ed. Ed couldn't get a box here within two months if he tried. Yeah. Oh, you should be getting a box this week. <laughs> oh, great. Well, I got uh, my I, uh, Must Learn KQL mug, uh, Microsoft oh, Security okay. Insights Podcast uh, edition. So, you know, anything's possible, Ed. Thank my you wife took shipping. mine. 
I don't get to use it anymore. <laughs> Making tacos in it. <laughs> Something. <right. laughs> she make a yeah. She's drinking so, bourbon. So, and apple so real cider quick. Um, speaking of community, Brody reminded me here. Thanks, Brody. Uh, speaking of community, um, you know, in the old days, it was really easy easy to engage with customers, right? You could you could go to a user group, you could go to a conference, you could go meet people at booze, and and even though you're not marketing, you did market what you do. Um, how is COVID and all this weirdness? How has this impacted you? What have you had to do to engage with community differently? That's a great question. I mean, we we were fortunate in that we had like a Slack channel set up for Atomic Red Team from the get-go, pretty much. And that is where a lot of our community engagement occurs. But we're also trying new things. So we have an Atomic Newsletter now, as an example, just a monthly where we send out stuff to be like, hey, this is what's new. These are our new contributors. Like, shout out to these new tests as a way to engage the community and let people know what's happening in the Atomic Red Team world and the MITRE attack world a little bit. So that's been really helpful. And now that we're all going to be back to in-person land a little bit, um, Red Canary proper is going to start showing up at conferences, but also the community team will will as well. And we'll be having the Atomic Red Team flag and waving that around. An example at uh, this upcoming RSA in California, we're going to have the Red Canary booth will be there, but the the community and Atomic Red Team will have its own special section of the booth. So if you want to come talk to us about open source land, like that's what we're here to do. And so, you know, as we, as we re-enter the world of everybody licking doorknobs, like, Hey, let's, let's all meet back up in person and, and, and get back to, to those kind of meet and greets. But we, the Slack channel has been amazing. The kind of turnout and the kind of questions people I'll, come through there. I'll also say like March, 2020, like everybody who worked anywhere got extremely twitchy about like, Oh no, <laughs> How are we going to sell our software if we can't go to trade shows? Right. So like mm-hmm. we kind of pitched, we're like, let's go all hands on deck. Like we had just launched the community team. Adam was not here. It was basically me and like a couple other people on the community team. Um, and I basically was just like, you know what? I will go and talk to whoever the sales team wants me to go and talk to, to like play my part and hope, hope the, hopefully the ship will stay afloat throughout whatever is about to happen. And I probably went and talked to two or three dozen like ISA chapters and OWASP chapters and like little rinky dink regional regional events. And the only things, the only things I ever talked about were either the threat detection report, atomic red team or both. Like my, my deal was like, yeah, I'll go talk to these people, but I'm not shilling products to them. I'm going to talk about things that I'm interested in. Um, and if you guys want to take that captive audience and, and send them emails after the fact, like go for it. That's, that's fine. So we actually, like, I wouldn't say we it presented an opportunity, but like we were lucky enough that like, we just came up with the right idea of how to handle this at the right time. We went fully virtual and we just were able to continue sort of like spreading the gospel, so to speak of atomic red team. Um, just, we went from doing it passively at booths to just being much more active about identifying groups that would be interested in hearing about it um, and talking to them. And the good thing was like a lot of these groups were like, yeah, you guys can have someone come talk to us, but they better not give a sales pitch. So the fact that I was like, well, I'm just going to talk about this free thing. <laughs> like it just all worked out really well. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm i a fan and it ties on to what you just said, because I like the good that you guys do. You know, Red Canary participates in the Department of Defense Skill Bridge Program, which I am one of the mentors inside of it. They help me separating uh, service members, get jobs in cybersecurity. And, and, and you guys got into it and I saw the name come up as one of the sponsors inside of it, right? So for those who are not familiar, Microsoft participates in that. So we go out and look for separating service members that want to come into the cybersecurity and we give them a mentorship program to come out. And you guys have been part of that for, well, before I joined and, and, and volunteered to do it. So I, I love the way you guys are doing it. So you have the outreach stuff down to a science, right? Outside of sales, right? Don't always try to sell me something, help me, you know? And then once you help me for free, I'm, I'm, I'm more inclined to ask for help for pay, right? Cool. Go that route. So big shout out to you guys taking care of our veterans that serve. They come out to give them a, a viable place to go out and continue their professional career. I really, really, really appreciate that. And yep, obviously yep, yep. I'm a fan because I put it in the SC200 you know, labs. There you did. Yeah. yeah. Your t-shirt's I, on the way, Frank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have how a fan many, because of the passion. 
Brian and I, Adam are showing for this product. I, like, honestly, guys, like, it's just great that you come on here and you're so passionate about this. So, so keep so it up. Adam, it's, it's fantastic. I'm oh, sorry, Brody. So, Adam, are you, yeah. where are you? Colorado? Uh, no. So, I'm based out of Northern California, actually, so, uh, which is where I'm located. Um, and, and, and actually, real quick, you all were, you know, giving us praise. And we, thank you so much. And I'm just blown away that you all invited us for your two year anniversary. Like, oh, when you, <laughs> during the intro, like, oh, they, they picked us, huh, for their for this special oh, it, event. It, it was yeah, believe me, it was, it was very deliberate. Was cake. So yeah, <laughs> Frank's the only one who actually knew until about an hour ago. So we didn't have any good. budget, so we picked three guests. <laughs> I, I I just been looking at the number of episodes growing, and I'll, I'll tell you something else. I um I, I like getting guests like you on, and we're very diverse and and about what we talk about. It's security based for the most part. Sometimes we deviate. It's, it's, it's getting everybody skilled up. One of Franklin's things is he likes people to learn. He likes people to learn and skill up. And I tell people, if you can skill somebody up, you know, you make them better, right? Have you um, looked at how to, how to gamify Atomic Red Team? Good question. You just keep bringing up these things that are like things that we've talked about in like the last three months. Um, so I'll, I will let Adam go ahead here. Yeah, it's it's one of oh, and actually we were talking about locations. Brian Brian is back east, um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside DC. Oh, oh, I'm in I I'm outside of. We'll get some lunch. I'm right outside of uh, DC too. I'm out here in Reston. So ah, great. No, he won't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he won't. exactly. He's not going to meet you for lunch. Yeah, I flew up there. You're asking me to get on lunch way, with this guy. He's like, you know what? I'm busy. I was like, Edward, you, you don't have right t-shirts. Meal. I, I don't. I don't meal. Pancakes. <laughs> Alexander is kind of Southern Virginia, so I don't know if I can make it. That's a, that's a Northern Virginia joke, so you have to understand that. Um, yeah, Ed, Edward came up and I blew him off for uh, dinner, so that's he's from Atlanta. So now that's so every single time someone's on here that's local, I ask them out to lunch just so annoy Edward. So all right, back to gamification. Gamification. So what's fun about open source stuff is that we can kind of do whatever we want, right? And it's all just a matter of time and resources because the last thing you want to do is like, hey, we're going to build this thing and open source it and then never touch it again. Like abandonware is everywhere in open source land. And one of my goals as someone who oversees a bunch of open source stuff is like not to have stuff that's abandoned out there. Because, uh, you know, everybody talks about like free as in speech and free as in beer and all these things. I think of it as free as in puppy right? Oh, look, free puppy. But there's a lot that goes into that, right? And there's, there's a lot of effort. You bring home a free dog, like there's expense and there's time and there's love you have to give these things. And so as we build new execution frameworks or gamifications or UIs or whatever, this thing has to be sustainable and ultimately probably maintainable by a community. And so there's lots of stuff we can do. And there's like a huge backlog of amazing stuff we could produce. We have to make sure it's sustainable and like someone can give it love and it's not going to be yet another thing flung on the GitHub with no commits in the past nine years. Right. Well, I mean, cause I can always go out and find a machine to root. I mean, that's, there's a million out there to, to do. Right. I mean, in a gamification environment, but from, you know, it's very hard for defenders to find good gamification for them to learn from, I think. Yeah. So I'm very interested in seeing where you go with that. Well, and it's funny, we act, so there was this prototype thing that I made uh, for internal, and I, was, I, it's kind of, I wasn't going to bring it up, but here we are. <laughs> and I, it was codenamed the Atomic Confetti Bomb. And like <laughs> all confetti bombs, it goes off and it's kind of loud, it makes a big mess, but it's pretty easy to clean, right? It's confetti, you just hoover it up and you're kind of done. And the point of the confetti bomb is it was, it was basically built around Atomic Red Team and unit tests. And so you just double click, double click a thing on a Windows endpoint and it just lights it up with a bunch of atomic tests. And you get a score of like, these are how many it executed successfully versus not. And now it, it was kind of a, was it successful, best guess. But the point of Confetti Bomb is, I don't wanna copy and paste a bunch of commands. I don't wanna learn a bunch of PowerShell invocation methods or I don't wanna download oh, a But why, why? why? Well, I think that they should learn that. Well, yeah, but some people just wanna light up some sensors, right? Like I just want my sysmon to do a thing. Like, so it was, it was tailored for that. But the point is, is that me as a non-programmer, I could build Confetti Bomb inside of a day or two and it's all built around the Atomic Red Team, that was really easy to do. And that's the kind of nice thing is you all have said a great idea. Why can't we somebody gamify this? Any one of your listeners could go do this right now. And it's all open source stuff. For the record, I, 
I clicked that confetti bomb sight unseen in a Slack message from Adam, just like, sure, I'll run it on my VM. Boop. Um, also, he's not giving himself enough credit. The atomic confetti bomb may well be the, uh, I don't know if I would call it, like probably the inspiration is the right word for the um, for the integration in Defender for Endpoint. Like there's more than a little confetti bomb inside that. Um, so <laughs> while it was a silly thing that he made, like, it immediately caught notice and, and people were very, very interested in being able to use it. That's awesome, guys. That's right. Right, Someone's getting up sued for time. the confetti bomb, by the way, yeah. that, which is a hilarious side topic. But yeah, that's a great name for it. One thing that I'm doing, um, I, I'm as you guys are talking, I'm crawling your site. And I noticed that uh, Red Canary would be one of the participants in the Cybersecurity Summit in Atlanta here in March. I've already signed up for it. I got a, I got a comp entry to come in. So if I'll come, I'll definitely come over to the table and see if I can get a T-shirt uh, and everything. I'll drop you guys' names and go, you know, they good, they good. Okay, yeah. Like a T-shirt on top of the T-shirt that they're going to send you, oh, and yeah, then the other sure. T-shirt well, for your they'll contributions. Give you, they'll, we'll send you Atomic Red Team shirts. We won't send you the the Red Canary shirts, so you can go get a Red Canary shirt from the folks at the booth. Fair. Um, at the at the sand yeah. summit in, in atlanta here in march i think you said yeah I, I, um, I am running out of conference shirts i have to say that yeah yeah uh, we're running up against one. time here i don't want to get edward in trouble with his wife yeah she, she she's already down. i can hear her scraping at the door she's eve in the door with a little battering ram like so running joke my wife and i have a standing dinner date every wednesday i'm actually because i've done some good in the house i can actually go to 6 30 but in the interest of time we would call it Thank you guys so much. You've been super informative. Cordell and Joe, you still owe me my NFR for our lab. You want us to showcase your product, send me my NFR. There you go. And uh, I, I, I like the company. You guys do good work, both from the, 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 the passion side and as for the corporate side. Doesn't mean to diminish you guys' passion, right, corporate. Uh, you are free to come back on this show, tonight, especially when you figure out how to gamify it. <laughs> you got to come back on the show. We want to see it, right? And um, your friends of the show, we really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much. Thank you. This is great, gentlemen. Really appreciate your yeah. time. Thanks for having to us. To our listeners, on. Red Canary. Thanks so much. I'm sorry. To our listeners, Red Canary, the Atomic Red team. There you go. Oh, by the way, Frank, uh, we need to get like an ending audio thing for our podcast. <laughs>